So welcome everyone. Um, today is the session three, uh, optimization for new proximity of the OpenMP training series. Start with some session topics. Um, <clears throat> you'll see the detailed subtopics uh, in the Christian slides later when he starts the new his um, session. So I just want to say something special. Next session in August is a special session from Ruth Van der Pass. Is also an another OpenMP expert, also author of uh, some OpenMP books as well. I'll introduce him more um, in next session, and we'll have a, a break for Christian and um, Michael for the deserve summer break. So for the exercises, uh, we will review the session uh, three exercise in the start of session five in September. Meanwhile, feel free to ask any questions uh, on Slack. And the slides for the first two sessions, recording exercises, you can find them on the uh, OpenMP training events page in NERSC, but also on the, um, the GitHub repo. Uh, speakers again, I will just put this up for a few seconds. I won't read them. They're truly experts, and we really appreciate their uh, spending time preparing slides, exercises, and also presenting them at the evening of um, German time for us. Thank you very much, uh, my question and question. <laughs> so logistics again, everyone is muted. Feel free to um, unmute and ask questions. And we are recording this training as uh, obviously you see. And if you prefer not to record your voice, uh, you can type question in Slack. Uh, we will re read it out for you or answer them in Slack directly. Um, there's a Slack channel if you haven't joined yet. Uh, I will have this slide deck has been posted on GitHub I will post GitHub repo in the chat, so feel free to join the Slack if you haven't. There's a promoter account, um, Slack channel, and general channel. And also a link to survey. I'll also post, post the survey link at the, end, um, at the end of this training session. So with that, I'm going to pass on to Christian and Michael for their official training. So welcome uh, to session number three. As always, we will start with a quick review of the uh, what we call the homework assignment. And of course, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to use the Slack channel. So the goal is that either Michael or myself uh, will take a look at, uh, at that. Uh, the topic of today is NUMA and SIMD. NUMA stands for non-uniform memory access or architecture, depending on uh, the context. And SIMD is a single instruction, multiple data um, approach of uh, parallel programming. So you will come to uh, that later on as well. So we will consider this in the context of uh, OpenMP and uh, review how that uh, uh, interferes with tasking, which was a topic of session number two. And um, yeah, that was uh, so far Numar, and then Michael will take over with uh, SIMD. So if you have questions on the previous uh, topic in particular tasking uh, take uh, the time while I'm presenting so, uh, solutions here to ask those questions preferably in slack not in zoom as Helen just pointed out and uh, that uh, then you do not lose any of the new content that we are going uh, to present in this uh, session oops zoom doesn't let me continue okay so if I remember correctly otherwise the slide deck will tell me we presented three homework assignments. The first one was Fibonacci. The second one doesn't have a real name. So it's about the four work sharing or the do in Fortran uh, and addressing an artificial load imbalance. And uh, the third one, if I remember correctly, was about uh, quicksort. So I wanted to make use of the Fibonacci code to explain again how tasking works in general. So. Uh, this is uh, now, I think, two or three slides explaining a little bit more than just the source code of um, the solution. So I guess you know Fibonacci, and um, uh, so the, the slide is not containing the um, disclaimer, but if you really want to compute Fibonacci numbers, don't follow this approach. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, recursive approach is computing the same value again and again and again, so it's highly inefficient. But the parallelization pattern is uh, really important. And we have something very similar with quicksort or with merge sort or with searching in a tree and or a graph and whatever. 
And the Fib, uh, or Fibonacci code is simple enough to fit on a slide or even a half one. That's why we use it to illustrate that. So um, we need, even when we use tasking, always a parallel region, uh, at least uh, for now in OpenMP, that gives us a team of threat. But if you know uh, the Fibonacci, let me call it the algorithm, it starts with a call to FIP, uh, standing for Fibonacci with a certain input number. And we need only one single thread or task. Now we can exchange those terms here um, yeah, to start with. So that's why we have, again, this pattern parallel single that gives us a team of threads, but makes only one thread execute this first call. The other threads, yeah, you know it, jump around the single and wait at the implied barrier, either at the single or at the end of the parallel. So I guess most implementations will eliminate the, uh, one of the two barriers, uh, which you would find at those kind of uh, uh, closing curly braces. Now let's take a look into the Fibonacci code itself. So we call Fibonacci of n minus one and Fibonacci of n minus two, which is, if we look at graph, yeah, follow the left and the right uh, branch in the tree, or um, if you have an uh, n-dimensional uh, graph, yeah, you would have uh, n calls here. So that's uh, why I meant this pattern is very representative. We can do this uh, going left and going right independently. Yeah? So this is why we have two tasks here. But now there are two small complications. Yeah? One is about sharing x and y, and the other is about the task rate. So let's look at the task rate first. Why do we need that at this level? Where the task rate ensures that before yeah, any threat or task can um, proceed after the, or can continue after this task rate, all the previously generated tasks at the same level, uh, this one and this one, are guaranteed to be completed. Not any further child uh, childrens of those uh, children of those tasks. Yeah? Only the direct uh, children. That's really um, important. Why do we need that? Well, we need x and y to be compu uh, uh, well computed before we can actually compute x plus y and return the sum. Yeah? Otherwise, we would have a data race yeah, and the wrong result. What about x and y? Remember the scoping. And um, uh, I believe we admitted that this might be the most complex part when looking at tasks uh, or tasks in OpenMP for the first time. So shared x and shared y basically says that we do not need additional x's and y's in addition to those that are created on the stack whenever this Fibonacci call um, happens or occurs. So this is like yeah, in C and C++, and of course, there's an equivalent in Fortran. We have two variables, x and y, declared in the function when the function is being called. And that doesn't matter if it's called from parallel or serial. Yeah. Uh, when the function is being called, we get variables x and y. We want to store the results in here and in here and use the same x and y and return them. Now, remember the rule in OpenMP, if we add the private variable, yeah, and this is a private variable because FIP is called from within a parallel region, then these private variables will become first private at the task in order to capture this environment. I believe this is a term I used, uh, or Michael and I used last time. We don't want that. We don't want to capture the environment yeah, because we want this x to be this x. And here again, yeah, only a single x. And this is why we say shared x and the same for y. Yeah. And I believe um, this illustrate or this uh, um, is enough, I hope, for explaining the code. If you redo the code on your own, yeah, try what happens if you lead out, uh, leave out the pragma OP task on line 21. And uh, yeah, first thing, do I really expect to speed up or not? Then do the experiment and think about the reason. And if you have a question, feel free to come back uh, to us uh, uh, either via Slack or next time we meet here. But let me illustrate again how this code um, will actually work. So we have uh, four threads, yeah? and um, uh, we start with a Fibonacci call with a value of four. Uh, remember, when a thread encounters the task, yeah, this is uh, now an, uh, kind of an illustration of the code shown on the previous slide, 
the task will be put onto the into the task queue and then is available for execution. And in the following, the color code um, means or different colors yeah, of those kind of bubbles here mean that potentially different threads are able to execute the code. For the first code, there's no parallel, first call, I'm sorry, there's no parallelism. So that means only a single thread is available uh, to execute this. And uh, this call will actually create two tasks, one for pip of n minus one and the other for pip of n minus two. Yeah? These will be put into the task queue. We encounter the task wait. And then the runtime has the choice to either take this thread or possibly two other threads. <laughs> wow, uh, that's a fancy animation effect, sorry. Potentially two other uh, threads to actually execute those tasks from the work queue. That means after one level of recursion, we have already two threads that we can get active. Yeah, same game again. And you see, you know, we're computing FIP of two again. Did that already FIP of one twice. This is what I meant before. Uh, the same result is computed over and over again. Yeah? Don't use this code to uh, compute Fibonacci numbers. But now in the second recursion step, we can already get four threads active um, to execute our tasks. Now, of course, uh, different colors mean different threads. That's just a potential execution. And uh, that means in the last step, um, we go more sequential um, again. And this is how it, uh, or this is the general pattern. Not the only one, but a very popular one to employ OpenMP tasks to express parallelism and recursive code. And uh, I believe you got the, or I hope you got the idea that after a few steps, yeah, the number of tasks is potentially significantly higher than the number of threads, but that also means that we have to do the cutoff at some point as illustrated last time. Now let's look at the other code. Yeah? That was one that we looked at uh, uh, already in the first, um, yeah, in the homework after the first uh, session. So we call a code, uh, a routine named do some computation that uh, is more expensive the higher the value of i is, yeah? and uh, it becomes exponentially more expensive. And that means if we parallelize over this loop uh, with a work sharing construct, we run into a severe load imbalance. So um, we could do this with tasking, and I believe I brought three examples. The first one is with tasking without reductions, then with tasking with reductions, and then with a task loop, the concept that Michael explained last time. Again, we need a parallel signal, yeah, this pattern here, so that one thread is executing the iteration from zero to dimension in creating all those tasks. Yeah. Um, we have a, uh, bum, 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 bum. I think this should read P result here. I'm sorry, I did a, a mistake here. So we have the task that computes P result equals uh, plus equals do some computation. Yeah, which is the first private variable, one per thread. And uh, uh, that means we use task to execute the while loop, uh, sorry, the, the for loop. But here at the end of the single, yeah, still within the parallel region, we have um, partial results in P result, yeah, in those private variables per thread. And then we make use of the critical uh, region in order to add those results um, a partial results to the global result. That was, um, let's say, a pattern important when there were no reductions in OpenMP tasks. So I will fix this slide here, Helen, afterwards. Now that we have reductions in tasks, yeah, and remember maybe last time we discussed when is a reduction result available. So that's complicating a few things. And this is why variables used in a task reduction have to be declared correspondingly. Yeah? So we say we do a reduction uh, over a variable in tasks. We have the same parallel signal pattern. And here at the task, we say in reduction. Still, I don't fully understand the reason why it's not called just reduction, but it is what it is. Yeah? Uh, the reduction clause on a task is named in reduction. The rest of the code is the same. And then finally, uh, the other solution is to make use of a task loop. So here, yeah, same thing regarding the reduction, but we still need a single. So task loop is not like the four work sharing construct. There's this important slide that Michael presented showing the difference 
between having the signal here or not. We want one thread to execute the loop because we want the loop to be executed only once. And uh, the task loop construct ensures that the loop iterations are distributed over um, tasks that are being generated. If you do a performance measurement, there's no better or worse for this particular um, example. Yeah? And then finally, quicksort, slightly more complex. Yeah? So quicksort is not an optimal algorithm for parallelization. It's very efficient uh, to go sequential. But uh, what's important here is at some point to do the cutoff. Yeah? Otherwise, performance is uh, or scalability uh, is disappointing. And uh, first uh, things first, the pattern that we showed earlier, yeah? quicksort left part, quicksort right part. We can do that independently and uh, we do the cutoff here so that means if the remaining part is smaller than let's say 10,000 elements uh, then do a serial quick sort which would be this code just without the openmp uh, construct and here i left out the pragma uh, parallel and so forth because you can find it in the uh, solution if you want a slightly better efficiency in parallel sorting uh, I would go with a merge sort and then fall back to a sequential quick sort if uh, the array is uh, small enough. Of course, if you look into literature, uh, there are many fancy things that you can do. And in particular, maybe you can make an exercise of that sorting. And SIMD is very interesting. So the final smallest uh, element should be sorted in uh, what is called in English, maybe um, a vector shuffle. Yeah, sorry. And uh, uh, this is where you can use uh, SIMD, but we don't have that prepared for today. Good. So, Michael or Helen, is there anything that I should wait for? Otherwise, I will just continue and jump right into NUMA. Yeah, anyone who want to ask any questions, you can unmute yourself. There's uh, no question on Slack right now or Zoom. Oh, there's okay. a question. Uh, uh, yes, I posted, a, I posted a question in <laughs> Slack. So yeah, the question is, what is the scope of shared X and shared Y in FIB? Let me go back here. So the scope in OpenMP terms is shared. Yeah? But we say shared because we don't want another variable. So X and Y are being declared here at the scope of the function FIB. That means when it's being called, and as I said, it doesn't matter if it's called sequentially or from within a thread or a task, X and Y are being generated, uh, created on the stack of the function. And shared means yeah, we do not want an additional new variable. Yeah? Just take this and this. Because we want this X to be this X and also this X. Otherwise, yeah, uh, we would get a new variable um, uh, uh, yeah, following the OpenMP rules. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so now let me jump into NUMA. So the, 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 I just I'm want sorry. to know there's also a comment in Slack. Ah. Thank you very much for the review of tasking. It's quite helpful. You're welcome. My pleasure. So questions, Fibonacci, oops, what? I did that already. Yeah, let's take a look at NUMA. So uh, non-uniform memory access, what does this mean? Well, take this uh, very simple uh, illustration of a multi-core machine. So I think I created this box in 2004 when dual core was a thing. So let's assume we have two cores with some caches. We do not care about the caches here today. Yeah, that form one socket and another two cores that form another socket. And then we have an interconnect yeah, in between. And uh, the interesting part is now that the physical memory is partitioned. Yeah? The simple thing is you could think of whatever, two dim slots yeah, or two sets of dim slots to actually give you a physical partitioning of the main memory. The technical reason is that the memory controller moved from whatever, somewhere on the chipset to being part of the processor. And actually now we have even more than a single memory controller per socket. But let's look at the main concept first. 
what happens if we run a code yeah, that like this allocates a large array called A yeah, and then initializes this array. If we have a partition main memory, the operating system finally has to decide where to put the memory yeah, and to put it either here or there. And now I explain very briefly what's going uh, to happen. Yeah? But NUMA means that if the thread is running here, you see this kind of error running uh, er arrow, yeah? running on the core. If the thread is accessing data that's allocated uh, physically placed here, then it can do so with a higher latency, uh, higher bandwidth and lower latency, really important, higher bandwidth, lower latency, than if it would be running over there. That would mean yeah, latency is higher, bandwidth could be slower because it has to employ this interconnect. The interconnect is there, yeah, it's shared memory, that's the benefit. So that means you as a programmer, you do not have to care about that. But if you uh, want to optimize performance, yeah, you should uh, control what's happening. And this is what this chapter is about. So the placement yeah, on the NUMA systems is important. Yeah? If you access what we call remote data, that means data on a NUMA node or this physical memory partition that's further away uh, from the thread yeah, executing you or the thread uh, than another one, you experience longer memory access times. And in particular, yeah, if then uh, the memory accesses crosses over this interconnect, you might experience a significant slowdown. At the end of the day, the memory placement comes from the operating system. And that means um, here we are to some extent outside of what OpenMP can control. And this is why uh, solutions uh, to this optimization challenge to some extent depend on the operating system. But only in so far as typically the operating systems, so Windows, Linux, Solaris, I never cared about uh, Mac OS for compute, I have to admit, use the so-called first touch placement policy. This sometimes is referred slightly different in the literature, but the idea is as uh, follows. Yeah? So we have this code again, yeah? that's a pointer to A, we allocate A and let's say, let's assume N is large. Yeah? So that means we create um, an uh, array that's a couple of megabyte in size. What's happening when the application executes the malloc? Basically nothing. Yeah? So I like to say the operating system makes kind of a mental note that this application sooner or later might need up to that amount of virtual memory. Yeah? So basically, yeah, this is not stressing the operating system because at the time malloc is being called, it doesn't physically allocate memory. This happens at the time of the so-called first touch. So here, when A of zero is being initialized with zero, yeah, the so-called page fault happens, which is different from an, a segmentation fault, so it's nothing bad. Yeah. A page fault happens. That means the operating system has to map this virtual memory to a physical memory location. Because we have to put this 0.0, .0 in this particular case somewhere. It doesn't do so on a uh, double granularity. It doesn't do so on a byte granularity. It does so on a so-called page granularity. And pages in Linux by default are four kilobyte in size, but they could also be larger, up to a couple of megabytes. Yeah? There are also some very special cases, but uh, four kilobyte could be a reasonable assumption on at least most HPC systems. So it means for A0, yeah, the operating system has to decide if it should go here or there, and it will employ this first touch strategy. That means if the thread, as indicated, initializing the data is running here, it will just select the physical memory that's available and closest to the thread executing the initialization. Yeah, so if it would be fully used, yeah, then data would end up here. But typically in HPC, uh, we use the nodes exclusively. So that means we can assume uh, the data or that the memory is available. And then A1, A2, and so forth will go there until, and that depends on uh, the, the data type size, yeah, the first access happens outside of this page boundary, let's say four kilobyte plus one. Yeah. Then again, the page fault happens and the operating system has to decide 
And that means it again follows the first touch strategy. So to summarize with malloc, you know, operating system does just uh, makes a mental note only with the initialization. Yeah, it has to put real memory behind this logical addresses. And you can check that you know, on your laptop, allocate, yeah, let's say 512 gigabyte with a malloc that will work. Yeah? So print hello world afterwards, initialize, and at some point uh, you will get the segmentation fault because then the operating system runs out of virtual memory, swap memory, and so forth. So uh, I, I guess it's a safe bet to assume that your laptop doesn't uh, contain 512 gigabyte of memory. How can we exploit that yeah, in OpenMP? So if you want to optimize for, form, for performance, we might want to have the data accessed by this thread over here and the data accessed by that thread over there. And the general idea is to bind the threads yeah, so that they sit uh, at, the, let's say, a set of cores, but do not move around and then also initialize the data in parallel and use the same access pattern in the initialization as later on will be used in the computation. So that's the core idea. Bind the threads and initialize the data with approximately the same access pattern or the closest to the same access pattern as will be used later on in the parallel computation. And if we do so, now we can get a significant performance improvement so that's a uh, really old machine, but it's um, uh, showing perfectly uh, the so-called NUMA-ness, yeah? the factor of memory bandwidth uh, introduced by NUMA nodes. So it's a Xeon 5675 processor. It could be a Westmare or something like that. The system retired since many years, executing the um, stream benchmark. Um, I might have to put that on the slide, sorry for that. Um, and uh, yeah, stream consists of uh, four operations. So copy takes one vector and copies it over into another ve vector. Let's ignore the rest. Yeah, So it's basically A equals B for vectors of, let's say, 300 megabyte in size. If we parallelize the copying, yeah, that's trivial, but do a serial initialization, yeah, all the data will sit on the memory closest to one CPU. If we then employ 12 threads, yeah, so we have two six core CPUs here, but only use one NUMA node. We get a memory bandwidth of let's say 19 gigabyte. And if we run the same parallel kernel, but with a parallel initialization, that's what I tried to explain earlier. So that means half of the data sits on socket one, half of the other, uh, the other half of the data sits on socket zero. And of course these six threads work with this chunk of the data and those six threads work with that chunk of the data, then we get the memory bandwidth of, let's say, 41 gigabyte per second. So about this factor of two. It's a little bit better because of caches and uh, so forth. And that's a fundamental idea. Now, with every NUMA node, we have another memory controller. And if we access uh, the data over more, more memory controllers, mostly independently, now we can increase the aggregated memory bandwidth available to our application. And this is why modern server processors not only have a single and not even only two, but uh, four or maybe even more memory controllers depending uh, on the exact model uh, and configuration. So as a rule of thumb, as soon as you see a two socket system, NUMA optimization applies. And uh, But for modern HPC system, even in a single socket, you have to deal with those effects. Yeah? And what does that mean? Yeah, you might get lucky and automatically get this 40 gigabyte, then everything is good. But uh, you should be sure to understand if your program is consuming the memory at the best possible bandwidth yeah, or not. And this is what this section is about. So I said our work plan is to bind the threads and then exploit parallel initialization to place the memory. And uh, there are a couple of OpenMP 5X features with, uh, that uh, provide more control. I will cover them afterwards. So let's start with thread binding. And before you bind the threads, you might want to understand a few things about the system uh, that you are using. Um, so there's a wide range of tools, yeah? but um, uh, on most HPC systems, that there's at least one uh, MPI implementation 
and uh, those all come with uh, a set of tools. So if you happen to use Intel MPI, there's a CPU info tool, or if you use Open MPI, which is the default on our system, there's hwlog-ls as a tool that displays a representation of the system topology, telling you this is in not, uh, a total amount of memory, this is amount of memory per NUMA node, this is amount of memory per cache and uh, so forth. Yeah? And it also tells you if processor ID 0 and 1 are actually neighbors on the same circuit or even core, or if they are distributed over two different sockets. Yeah? And this also depends on settings, typically outside of the user control. HWLog is a library that comes with additional tools, so you can even get a nice graphical uh, representation of the system topology. But this one gives you a command line output. Then yeah, you have to understand how to bind the threads. So if you have fewer threads than cores, yeah, there are at least two fundamental strategies. So either you put the threads far apart, let's say two threads on two sockets, or you put them closely together, two threads on the same core. There's no universal right or wrong as so often in life, yeah, but it depends on the properties of your application. So if you put two threads on two different sockets, yeah, as a one extreme case, um, you have typically more cache sizes, aggregated cache sizes or combined cache sizes and memory bandwidth, but you're also using much more hardware. Yeah? So modern systems come in particular with large level three caches, many memory controllers. So if you use uh, two sockets um, compared to two threads on a single socket, this typically gives you better performance, except for when you have a lot of uh, fine-grained synchronization. Yeah? Then let's say the log variable has to travel between the two sockets via the cache coherency protocol. And for some applications, this is measurable. So then yeah, it could be profitable to put the threads closer together. Of course, then uh, you do not get all the advantages of using all the hardware. This is uh, are just two simple examples. There's more to consider, um, but uh, to illustrate that there's no right or wrong. So my advice would be with your application to try different settings and see uh, is your application sensible towards binding and uh, in particular placing of uh, the memory. Uh, or not. And if it is, yeah, then you have to think about um, it. So now I'm going to explain how to bind the threads. There's a mechanism in OpenMP uh, that consists of two things. First, the OpenMP places as an abstraction of the system topology, and then the so-called OpenMP thread affinity policies as a strategy to bind uh, the threads. So the places, yeah, um, I come to that on the following slides actually represent the granularity at which binding um, is being requested by you and then performed by the OpenMP runtime. So we have uh, a couple of abstract names available or uh, you can use processor IDs, but I, I wouldn't recommend that because that uh, would change from system to system. So the default on most implementations is that there's uh, an environment variable value like OMP places equals course. So OMP places is an environment variable that you as a user can uh, set to a specific value. And this setting would give you one place per core. Having a set of places, you can either define to evenly spread the threads over the places, yeah, put them closely together, or co-locate all the threads with a primary thread. And there are reasonably, uh, uh, reasonable use cases for all three of them. Um, but in many cases, yeah, or, or relating to the earlier slide, spread means use more hardware, close means uh, use cores closely together. I have a couple of examples on the following slides. So let's assume, uh, uh, now we have to look at the OMP places environment variable. Let's assume the following machine. So the green boxes intend to represent two sockets. The kind of bluish boxes intend to represent one core. Uh, so we have four cores per socket, eight cores per, uh, in total in the machine. And the white bubbles uh, intend to represent hyper threads. And it means uh, we have four threads per core. So we have two times four times four execution engines, if you want to use an uh, independent word uh, for that. 
So we can set the OMP places environment variables to abstract names like threads, core, sockets, last level caches, and NUMA domains. So the latter two were introduced with OpenMP 5.1. So if we set them to cores, as used on the previous slide, we end up with one place, uh, which is a target for binding an OpenMP thread, one place per core, which would give us eight places uh, with IDs from zero to seven in this particular machine. Yeah, threads would give us eight times four equals 32 places. Sockets would give us two, namely one per socket. Last level caches is undefined in my concrete example. So you would get one um, per a set of cores that share a last level cache on modern systems. Uh, that's typically one or maybe even two per socket. And NUMA domains, yeah, that would be two or four per socket, depending on the configuration of your system. So again, you might want to use the tools I mentioned earlier. So what's special about the place? I already said that OpenMP threads are not bound to cores as enumerated by the operating system, but instead they are bound to those OpenMP places, but then they can roam within the place. And that's why I meant the places denote the granularity at which binding should be performed. So you might want to bind the thread only to an individual socket. Why is that? Well, if you want to do an offloading, oops, I'm sorry, offloading to a, a GPU, yeah, the GPU is attached via whatever interconnect, typically closer to one socket than to the other socket. So you might just care about the socket. If you really want to lay out data for NUMA, as is the topic here, you might want to bind a thread to one particular core and exploit the parallel initialization as shown earlier. So let's put everything into an example. And we have a slightly more complex example here because we're using nested OpenMP. That means one parallel region calls another parallel region, for example, in a library. So we end up with 16 threads in here. On the outer parallel region, we use uh, proc bind spread as the affinity policy. So we can specify this with a proc underscore bind uh, clause. And on the inner parallel region, we use close. So that could resemble something like a, let's say, mini domain composition on the outer level, and then a solution of a linear equation system with a parallel library on the inner level. Yeah? But you could come up with many other uh, examples here. This is also showing the regular expression support in OpenMP to bind the, uh, to define the places. So you could enumerate um, co processor IDs as enumerated by the operating system in parentheses to form an individual place, or you could use a regular expression uh, as shown here. But my advice is really to use one of the abstract names. This spread yeah, on the first parallel region. So this is the initial. Um, binding, uh, the OpenMP thread binds the initial thread as soon as it becomes active. Then spread for four threads means yeah, those four threads are evenly spread out over the places in the system. So if you would end up with only seven places, yeah, this one would not be existing. Uh, so it's as evenly as possible. Uh, I hope that translates to English. And it also does something special. It partitions the place list. And that's only true for spread. So it means inside here, this thread sees the place list to consist of only two places, whereas here, the same thread, uh, the primary or the initial one, sees the place list to consist of eight threads. And this is important because inside, uh, now taking a look at this one here, red denotes the initial thread per parallel region. Uh, close means we put thread zero and one on the first place and two and three on the second place within the local place list. So close does not mean put everything on the same place. This is primary in the OpenMP6 or 5.x. Uh, it was called master before. Uh, but it uh, means um, put the threads closely together over the places. So if you have four threads and only two places, we have to end up with two threads per place. Good, now we have a couple of examples, huh? but uh, time is progressing. So let me just uh, explain what's happening here and then be really quick on the other uh, examples. Again, let's assume the same machine. So we took those questions from the OpenMP forum. So someone wanted uh, the parallel region with two threads, one per socket. Yeah? 
So granularity is sockets, OMP places equals sockets. Then we say parallel region num threads two. We want two threads. Proc bind spread, that will put one thread on the first socket, meaning first uh, place, and the other thread on the second socket, uh, representing the other uh, place. Yeah. Same for four threads, one per core. Okay, let's do this um, as well. Uh, so we say, but only on the uh, first socket. Uh, so we say num threads equals four because we want to have four threads. One per core gives us a granularity proc bind close, yeah? assuming we have uh, enough cores per socket uh, means uh, one thread per um, core, but closely uh, together. And this is what we discussed earlier. So we also have the OpenMP places API as a feature to query what's going on. Yeah? So that means you could write a code that gives you a place number and then a process host per place and so forth. Um, but in OpenMP5, a new feature was introduced. Uh, so Helen was heavily involved here to get um, um, a helpful uh, information about how Affinity uh, is being implemented by the OpenMP runtime by setting this environment variable OMP display Affinity to true. So this instructs a runtime to display formatted Affinity information whenever that changes, and particularly it changes for the first time when you execute a parallel region. Uh, so you could get output like this. So you are at the first parallel region, thread zero and thread one. Thread zero is bound to course zero one, thread one is bound to course two and three. And together with information on the hardware topology, this allows you to debug your affinity seconds as uh, settings and optimize for performance. With the OMP affinity format environment variable or the format specifier um, passed as an argument here, you can influence what is being printed. And if you want to print this information, um, yeah, whenever you need it in your code, you can use the OMP display affinity uh, API call. So what kind of information is available? Yeah, you get the, the number of teams and the team number. Um, you get the nesting levels, the number of threads in a parallel region, as a number of threads in the thread ID. Uh, if you have a nested OpenMP region, you get can get the information at um, ancestor levels. That means higher up in the tree. If you are in, important to interact with API, uh, with MPI, you can also print the host name. So it means if you print the affinity of multiple processes, yeah, you get the process identifier. And if they're running on different hosts, you get also the host name to be able to actually figure out which thread is bound where. You can get the native thread identifier and, um, um, yeah, it's enumerated by the operating system. And of course, the list of processors, meaning cores to which a thread is being bound. So a very useful tool. So to summarize yeah, what we want to achieve with NUMA optimizations, and uh, we hope that uh, you can experience some successes with the examples that we provide or the homework that we provide, is to carefully touch the data in parallel. That means use the same thread initialization as during uh, the computation. However, yeah, admittedly, sometimes this is not, um, yeah, there are limits to this strategy. In particular, if you do not know yeah, which thread is going to use which data or which slice of the data in the uh, computation. Then, of course, it becomes more complex. So you can specify a couple of uh, memory allocation strategies that vary from operating system uh, to operating systems and all the, the privileges that you as a user uh, might have. Um, so in, in those cases, yeah, where it's really um, complex, or let's maybe maybe in every case, yeah, I would recommend you to run your program as you're used to run it, then run it at, with a NUMA CTL dash interleave equals all parameter. And uh, that means, oh, sorry, tool yeah, with this argument, that means the NUMA, uh, the memory pages as allocated by the operating system are distributed over all the NUMA nodes available to your program in a round robin fashion. And if you execute, if you compare the execution here and without the setting and you see a difference, 
uh, then it means yeah, you have to investigate if you can improve your program's runtime regarding memory access. If there's almost no difference, yeah, then you're uh, lucky that your, your program's uh, um, performance is probably not affected by NUMA. Finally, if you enter to have full control, yeah, let's assume you have an adaptive refinement code, yeah, and that means the data access pattern changes over time. You can make use of the Linux command move pages to actually take a page and move it from one NUMA node to another one. Yeah? But this is tricky, not portable, um, and, not, uh, and of course, outside uh, the scope of OpenMP. So far for NUMA, there's also another memory topic that I would uh, like to present here before handing over to Michael. And this is about managing memory spaces. And that basically means managing different kinds of memory. So if you're watching how uh, HPC systems are being designed nowadays, yeah, there's a trend to have more than a single kind of memory. That means more than a single uh, technology, memory technology in the system. And I'm talking about main memory and not only uh, caches. Yeah? So we all know that we have that there's DDR4 and uh, in particular DDR5 based main memory. But some systems also exhibit so called high bandwidth memory, and other systems exhibit so called non volatile or large capacity memory, and some might even show both. So it's not useful and not present in all systems, yeah? but some uh, do have it. So here we have an Intel Cascade Lake system with DDR-based memory and uh, large capacity memory, uh, meaning uh, uh, the DDR5 mm, or 4, I think DDR4-based memory with an Intel Octane. Yeah? Not very po uh, popular in HPC anymore, um, but uh, this is just uh, to show you the output of HWLog-LS on uh, such a uh, system. Yeah. So if you want to program for this, there are low-level APIs, but there are also high-level APIs in OpenMP that allow you to control yeah, which memory your application will be using. And it also enables the OpenMP runtime to optimize the mapping of certain requests regarding memory to the memory that's physically available. And uh, in the same idea as uh, the OpenMP places were kind of an abstraction of the system topology, now we have some requirements for the memory that is an abstraction of concrete memory technologies. And in OpenMP, this is realized via so called allocators. So if you're a C programmer, you know, uh, you probably know the concept of an allocator from STL. But it's basically an object, uh, and then the OpenMP allocator is an OpenMP object that will fulfills requests to allocate and deallocate storage for program variables. And those could be scalars, but in most cases, of course, these are later larger variables. OpenMP allocators are of type OMP allocator handle T. Yeah, we can make sense of that in a couple of uh, seconds. And um, there's also a default allocator. Uh, that can be specified via the OMP allocator environment variable for a corresponding API. So OpenMP5 came with, with a set of memory allocators, and uh, this is a list. I hope I didn't forget anyone, but uh, what I'm trying to indicate here that for most programs, only one is of good use. And admittedly, in all the implementations I looked at, only one is actually available. So this is called the O OMP, OpenMP, high bandwidth memory allocator. So that means, yeah, and uh, sorry, default memory allocators also probably available. That would select the memory with the high, with high bandwidth or even the highest bandwidth, yeah, excluding caches, of course. So that means you could write a program that for some data structures uses the default memory allocator and for others the high bandwidth memory allocator. And then when you execute your program, the OpenMP runtime will figure out if there's any such thing uh, as a higher bandwidth memory than the main memory that also has enough capacity to fulfill your demands and then make use of that technology. Otherwise, yeah, unless you did something else, it will fall back to the default memory. So that means this abstraction. So you have certain requests 
for the memory. And if it's available, the OpenMP runtime will do the mapping. Yeah, you could also ask for the lowest latency memory, the large capacity memory, yeah, which would be this uh, NVMe memory as uh, shown before. And in the context of GPU programming, there are also other allocators that we are going to discuss maybe at one of the GPU uh, sessions after the summer break. How to make use of that? So uh, let's look at this first. So we have OMP alloc as a drop-in replacement for malloc. So it takes one argument, namely the size, and one of those predefined allocators as listed on the previous slide as a second argument. And then we'll make use of this allocator uh, to fulfill the request. We also have to free the memory. And here the allocator argument is optional. Yeah? So as a user, uh, you can shake your heads about this uh, uh, design, yeah? ask for something special, but make it optional. However, some implementers claim that if you provide the allocator here, um, the freeing will be done uh, slightly faster. So I would argue that freeing is mostly outside of the time critical part of the program, but nevertheless, here it can be faster. You can also make use of the allocate clause on any construct with a data sharing clause. So think of a private clause. Yeah? That means we get new data elements, namely one for each thread or task. And if you also want to make use of an OpenMP allocator to allocate those new data elements, yeah, make use of the allocate clause, specify the allocator, and then the list of variables. Yeah. If you do not specify the allocator, the OMP default allocator will be used. And finally, in uh, Fortran, so Michael might have to help me here with questions, but I believe if you have an allocatable array, you can use put the allocate directive in front of that and then it will make use of this corresponding, meaning specified OpenMP allocator to execute this allocation of an allocatable array. I guess that's the idea. However, sometimes you might want to use additional features in allocator. And then now I, I know I understand this is getting really advanced. So I will speed up yeah, and keep the slides as a reference. Um, so there are so-called allocator traits, which are like settings of an allocator, if you don't know the term trade. And uh, two are of uh, high interest. So there's one that's called fallback and the other is called partitioned. I believe I have yes, details on the following slide. So fallback means what should happen if the uh, de designed behavior or the requested behavior cannot be fulfilled. So what happens if you ask for high bandwidth memory, but the system doesn't have any high bandwidth memory? Or what happens if you ask for 64 gigabyte of high bandwidth memory, but the system has only 48 gigabyte of memory? Of course, the runtime doesn't know, so you can uh, describe you know, or prescribe what should be happen. Yeah, that's a default return to the default memory, but you could also ask for uh, return a null, and yeah, that means handle it within the application, abort the whole program, yeah, that means give up, or use a different allocator. If you want to allocate data structures for transfer to the GPUs, yeah, you can ask for pinned memory. That means memory that can't be paged in and out by the operating system or moved around in any other form. That could give you, um, to some extent, uh, for RDME operations, a performance improvement. And this one here is also of interest. Oops, uh, there's a partition trait. And uh, here we can actually um, perform the NUMA optimization uh, with lots of detail during the allocation. So we can ask for the default behavior, but we can uh, explicitly ask for the closest memory, you know, or we can uh, lay out the data in a blocked partitioning or an interleaved um, partitioning with additional arguments to define the block uh, size. Yeah? If you don't uh, put any defaults, uh, typically uh, blocking or interleaving is done on the page granularity. Now, how to make use of those traits? Well, you have to create your own allocator with OMP INIC allocator, specify a mem space. Yeah? This, co this corresponds to the allocators that are predefined, but this is on the next slide, and then specify in the, uh, an array of size n traits of the actual uh, traits here. And at the end of the program, you have to uh, destroy the allocator um, as well. And these are the memory spaces that are uh, available. So the default memory space, large capacity, 
or high bandwidth memory or low latency memory if available on your system. So let me summarize that. Yeah? If you want to make use of those uh, systems with multiple memory technologies, meaning multiple kinds of memory in a node, um, and you do not, and you want to avoid, which I would recommend, uh, you, uh, you want to avoid uh, using vendor specific or technology specific APIs, OpenMP provides uh, with these uh, APIs a mechanism to do so. And uh, since the allocator is um, uh, of a, a special OMP allocator handle T type, you can even pass it as an argument. That means if you want to play around with it, for example, with traits and so forth, you do not have to modify all the sites at which an allocation occurs, but only the site at which you actually uh, construct your allocator. Uh, if you want to make, uh, or the good question is what is um, available? Yeah. So in particular for high bandwidth memory implementations are pretty good, but there are also some uh, for persistent memory or large capacity memory in the other words. And of course, DDR based main memory um, is available. Um, I particularly looked at the Clang's implementation. However, these uh, slides uh, or for this slide, I compiled a summary for SC23. Uh, so it's from uh, winter last year. Uh, so nearest and blocked partition values were not implemented, yeah? but um, uh, most of the parts were implemented in particular high bandwidth memory was always mapped uh, to the right kind of memory according uh, to our um, expectations. Sorry, this apparently uh, is not uh, readable here at the end of the slide. So that uh, concludes my presentation. Oh, no, it does not. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, now we talked about NUMA and binding threads, yeah? but uh, at, uh, in, in the last session, we talked also about tasks. And now just one hint, how to relate tasking to affinity, because with tasking, yeah, the main idea is to give the runtime significantly more freedom to schedule the tasks. Whereas with thread binding, yeah, we're actually reducing the freedom of the runtime. How can we do that, uh, put that together? Well, the, uh, general, the summary is to continue uh, with thread binding, but to use the affinity clause on an OpenMP task to give an runtime, the runtime a hint of where to execute the task, but not to prescribe uh, exactly um, uh, uh, yeah, where to. Uh, execute it. So this is a hint. Yeah? That means it's not a dependency that has to be followed. It's a hint that may be ignored or may be followed. And to some extent, it might depend on the quality um, of the implementation. Um, let me show an example. So if you would be crazy enough to implement the stream benchmark or any memory copy operation with OpenMP tasks, yeah, if we have a code like this that performs a certain chunking of A equals B plus scalar times C with A, B, and C being reasonably large arrays, you might want to say this task here has an affinity to uh, array slice A, and that means it will be executed uh, on the uh, one of the cores that is possibly closest to where A is being allocated. Yeah? So don't get me wrong. Using tasks to implement stream will not improve performance. Uh, the only goal would be to become as good as an, a traditional stream. Yeah? So for such a very regular access pattern, you don't do not need tasks, uh, but with the affinity, you can improve performance uh, on NUMA uh, systems. But use this wisely. Yeah? So the following complex diagram, or to some extent complex diagram, is meant to explain that do not uh, to not put an affinity clause on any task yeah? because it's expensive. So if the OpenMP runtime encounters a task region with an affinity uh, with no affinity clause, then it will just enqueue the task as we learned it last time. However, if there's an affinity clause, yeah, the runtime has to find out where to execute the task. So it will first take a look into an internal data structure reference. Um, uh, yeah, referred to here as a map to find out, do I know where this data is? Yeah. In most cases, yeah, um, the answer could be no, 
Yeah, but if it's yes, yeah, then the task will be put into the queue of another thread yeah, with the goal to have this other thread execute the task. But uh, now this is where it, uh, why it's expensive. Yeah, if if the runtime doesn't know where the data is, it has to find out. Yeah, so it has to find out via the operating system, which is a switch to the kernel end, uh, the NUMA domain where the data is stored, and then select one of the threads that pin to the NUMA domain uh, to put the task into the queue and also save this uh, reference information for the next lookup, yeah, like here to speed up things. So this is expensive. Yeah? But again, um, uh, it might be worth it if you have uh, memory bandwidth um, and computationally heavy enough tasks to optimize for NUMA, yeah? uh, but don't use it if there's no need uh, for that. In addition, Affinity will bring down um, whoops, yeah, the variation yeah, because it's more predictable. So here we were looking at, um, um, <laughs> um, I didn't put the name uh, on here. So one diagram is for a quick sort, one is for stream. Sorry, I copied the old version of the slide uh, deck. Yeah? So it will uh, reduce the, uh, that is, I guess, quick sort, the medium runtime uh, of the median runtime of the program, because in most uh, runs, yeah, the affinity information will be used to optimize the execution. And um, uh, that's a whole program runtime, and that's the same view uh, for individual uh, tasks. Sorry, I will fix uh, the slides uh, here later on. So why is it uh, possible? Because if we uh, do give the right hint, and if the OpenMP runtime follows the hint, yeah, we um, the, the the program will use more local data. Yeah? So here we make use of hardware performance counters uh, to reduce the remote data, um, the amount, uh, the number of remote memory accesses. Yeah? And uh, remote memory, of course, has lower bandwidth and higher latency, as I uh, explained earlier. However, yeah, it's a hint. Yeah, it's not a requirement, and if whatever the operating system interrupts our program for a short amount of time, uh, the runtime uh, might come uh, to different results, and this is why it's not guaranteeing yeah, a better performance, but it's a hint uh, that uh, only works in most of the cases. So as a summary, in summary yeah, thread affinity comes with a cost, but can help with task parallel programs on NUMA. Yeah? Stealing, work balancing, and so forth, load balancing is what I meant, is still allowed. Yeah? That's uh, why it's a hint and not a, um, a prescription, um, but use it wisely. And this brings me to the end of my talk. Mike or Helen, is there anything to take care of right now? Um, not really. Uh, the only thing that was on Slack uh, was a recommendation that I placed um, that when you use a batch system like Slurm, don't use the explicit place IDs, but use abstract names because otherwise you will have difficulties finding out which exact course um, you got. And then somebody was um, saying that this is a very complicated topic. And so just to remind folks, uh, there's nurse documentation um, that basically shows how to do proper process affinity, um, CPU pinning, and how to basically um, lay out an MPI process with respect to the OpenMP threads so that you get a nicely laid out um, allocation across um, a subset of the cluster. So a quick rule of thumb, if there's a NUMA domain, use, um, uh, don't use OpenMP threads across NUMA domains because there's a memory uh, penalty uh, accessing far away uh, NUMA domain. And then the, uh, we also have a web page and JavaScript generator. So it helps you to figure out the Slurm settings. There's specifically, there's a dash C, how many logical cores per MPI, et cetera. So when the exercises, you will probably help you to reinforce this uh, concept in the web page. So and after that, if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask in Slack. So we said I hand it over to Mike. On Simd, right? Yep.
and basically uh, go for um, the first part of SIMD today for the remaining about 15 minutes that are left for today's um, episode. And then in the next um, episode in September, uh, we will then uh, dive into more of the specific aspects of how OpenMP SIMD works. But I can at least, you know, um, start about explaining what SIMD is and, you know, how things, how things look like um, and uh, where the, why OpenMP SIMD is useful. All right. So, um, as you know, I work for AMD. So basically my focus is mostly on x86 architectures. And so I'm, I'm showing SSE AVX, AVX 512 here, but you know, you can think about that. Um, this is something that is across the board, right? So, uh, if you look at the arm ecosystem, arm has uh, the scalable vector extensions, which is, uh, very similar to AVX 512 in most implementations, but. Uh, that supports um, vector width up to two kilobits. Um, but basically the, the idea here is that within a single instruction, so SI, uh, you process multiple data elements. That's the MD part of SIMD. Um, and so when you consider something like AVX 512, you get the equivalent of eight double precision values, 64 bit values, or 16 times a single precision value. Um, and then on top of that, there's a whole uh, slew of additional instructions that deal with integers. So you can have long integers, uh, regular integers, short integers, eight byte integers, eight bit integers, uh, as well as characters, depending on which exact version of, of AVX or the uh, vector instruction set uh, you're looking at. And the way this now works is that, you know, like we already, I already explained, um, you have like a single instruction. In this case, on this slide, I'm showing a V at, so a vector addition uh, that basically takes two source operands, source one and source two, and produces a destination operand or destination register. Uh, and it does so by uh, doing an element wise summation of each element in each of the source vectors. And then it produces the result vector that then co um, corresponds to the element wise sum of the two input operands. Now this is easy, right? So this is something that um, that compilers are actually quite good at producing uh, typically, um, but there's more complexity to those instruction sets than just this. And the, the complexity starts um, with um, uh, what is typically called fused multiply add instructions. So here you have actually three source operands uh, and um, depending on the architecture, you have one of those sources being the destination operand, or you have a fourth operand to uh, denote the destination. Um, and so what happens here is that we take two sources, we apply the first operation, in this case, uh, a multiplication, and then we take the intermediate result of that operation, and then we add the third register on top of that, again, doing that in an element wise fashion. So the destination now will contain A times B plus C, which is also quite a common uh, operation in, in typical HPC codes. The complexity here is that the um, instructions typically violate the floating point contract that the compiler has from the programming language. And it cha slightly changes the accuracy of the results. And so in the end, you won't get the same bitwise reproducible result, or chances are that you don't get the same bitwise reducible result. And so, you know, typically when you want these kind of instructions to be selected by the compiler, uh, you have to basically tell the compiler that it's ex explicitly allowed to pick those. Uh, so there's compiler options um, to do this. The other thing that is uh, um, complicated for the compiler to understand is, uh, so-called predications or mask registers. Um, what happens here is that on top of the um, arithmetic registers that you put into the instruction, you can have a mask register. And that mask register uh, contains either a false value per element or a true value. And the idea is that only where the mask register has a true value, it basically makes it so that the uh, instruction has an effect. Whereas where there's a false um, value in the register, the effect 
of the operation is is not does not materialize. And then it really depends on the on the exact architecture that you that you have. So some architectures basically keep the original value of the destination register. Uh, some other architectures may have another operand, uh, either one of the sources or even an, an additional operand. Uh, where you pick the um, the value that should be retained. Um, and so basically the idea here is that you can produce those mask instructions uh, using vector compare instructions. Think of that as being a SIMDized or vectorized if statement. Uh, and then you can basically, you know, sh push the effect of the uh, condition and the, uh, the, the branch selection of your if statement, whether it's true or false, you can push that into the individual instructions uh, so that you don't have to actually materialize the if in your code, but rather just the evaluation into that mask register. And then um, what compilers um, are usually good at if it's a standard data type, but uh, kind of fail to produce good code for if it's a user-defined data type is um, uh, blends, shuffles, swizzles, and you name it. So basically load instructions or data movement instructions where they change the data format of the data inside the register. So what I'm showing here is that, you know, some of the elements are just routed through the same way or at the same location as they were before. And then some other values are rotated around. And, you know, you, you can think of this as being useful as when you deal with complex instructions um, and complex um, arithmetics, um, where you want to separate out the real value of, um, of the complex number and the imaginary part, uh, you can use those instructions to actually do this, um, you know, do the proper math on the separated complex numbers and then reconstruct uh, the usual number format in memory. And like I said, for complex numbers, the compiler is usually able to figure this out, but if you have an like, say derived type in Fortran that corresponds to RGPA, so red, gre uh, red green, blue, and alpha channel, um, then typically it's, it becomes really um, hard for the compiler to understand how it needs to adjust the data format uh, to do this uh, area of structure and structure of array conversion for you. Now, the good news is typically compilers have something called auto vectorization. So the idea here is that um, inside the optimization passes of the compiler that the compiler does for you anyways. And especially in this case, the uh, loop optimization passes, uh, we implement a code analysis that detects code properties that allows or disallows SIM vectorization. Then we have heuristics on top of that to determine if SIM execution might be beneficial. So that means it actually gives you a speed up at runtime. And if that, um, goes well. So basically the, um, the code analysis um, tells us that we can do the SIMD vectorization and the heuristics uh, tell the compiler that uh, there's a speed up to be expected from this transformation, then the compiler will actually generate uh, SIMD instructions. And for some of the compilers that are out there like Clang, GCC and the Intel compiler, here's the compiler options that you would have to use. So for Clang LLVM, which also includes the AMD compilers, it's dash F vectorize um, and M prefer vector with to select which kind of instruction set you want to target. So if you want to target SSE, AVX or AVX 512. Uh, for GCC, it's F3 vectorize. Um, and for the Intel compiler, it's a simply uh, dash vec. The other thing that is important, and we'll we'll get to this uh, then in in September, is to also have reporting by the compiler to basically tell you whether the auto vectorizer kicked in, because that's the code that you don't have to care about yourself. It's only those places where the compiler, for some reason, and we'll go through that uh, in a minute, uh, basically failed to auto vectorize your code. Uh, and for, for Clang based compiler, that is dash capital R pass equals loop and then dot backslash star, which is uh, like a regular expression to say report on all the loop passes that start with loop or all the passes that start with loop dash. Um, for GCC, it's opt info vec all. And for the Intel compiler, if you use that one, then it's q opt report equals vec. And then the compiler will tell you um, what it could not vectorize. And ideally, it will also tell you why it couldn't vectorize a piece of code. Now, 
The important thing is, what are these uh, code properties that actually inhibit uh, sim devectorization? So there's a whole bag of, of reasons why the compiler uh, may fail to vectorize your code. Uh, first and foremost, in many codes, it's data dependencies. I'll get to this in a minute. But there's other potential reasons, like function calls inside the loop body that uh, where we don't have a vectorized function. Again, we're going to revisit that topic in September. Uh, if the con uh, complex control flow or the control flow is too complicated for the, for the compiler to deal with, uh, most, loaded, most notably some of the very old uh, Fortran codes out there, which weather codes, for instance, which have massive loop blocks with like thousand lines of code. Uh, these are typically bad candidates to be auto vectorized. Um, sometimes the compiler cannot figure out if you mix data types like single precision float and double precision floats, how to deal with that situation. And sometimes it's just uh, because you um, stride through your array in the wrong order. So let's say in Fortran, instead of doing uh, column major, you do row major. So you have non-unit stride between the elements that you process. Then the compiler also typically will not do the vectorization because either it cannot pick the right instructions um, or the heuristics basically tell the compiler that the resulting code may be, in, may be inefficient. All right, so data dependencies. So suppose you have two statements, S1 and S2. Um, S2 depends on S1 if you have to execute S1 before S2. If you flip them around, you get a different result, right? So this is basically introduces an order in which the individual statements of your programming language and the resulting assembly instructions on the machine have to be executed. And these uh, dependencies come in different flavors. So control flow dependence, for instance, is when the control flow basically decides which is the next instruction. So say you have an if condition and you have a true and an else part of that if statement, then a, uh, you, up, you have to basically uh, evaluate the if condition first before you know whether you have to execute the true or the else part. So you have to do this first and then start executing either one of those statements from those blocks. Um, data dependence is actually what I'm showing here on the slide. So that is where the data flow through the instructions kind of give the order of execution. So for instance, a flow dependency that I have on the left-hand side of the, of the slide basically says you have S1, which sets a variable to its initial value, in this case, 40. And then you have another statement as two, where we add two to this, to this variable and store it into C. Now, we have to execute A equals 40 as the first instruction or the first statement, because if we flip those two statements around, we probably con compute um, a wrong result. B equals 21 on the other side, um, we can move around freely. Right, at least with respect to those two instructions or statements that I'm showing here, because it's no, it's not used anywhere. Uh, nobody actually reads B, uh, and so we can move it around re with respect to S1 and S2, so it doesn't have a de data dependency on those two statements. Then there is also a so-called anti-dependence, um, where basically we read a value of B in this case, B equals 40. And then we have another statement S2 where we reset the value of B to be something different. And so now we have to execute S1 before S2 because if we flip those two around, we will not compute A equals 41, but instead we, will, we would compute B equals 22, which would likely be a surprise um, for the user. And those dependencies, they can carry across loop iterations, in which case we call them loop carry dependencies. Um, the syntax box in the middle of the slide basically contains such a dependency where in one iteration we are um, writing A equal A of I with an expression that involves a computation that uses A of I plus 17. And so now we have a certain order in which we have to execute this loop um, because if we turn the loop around, like compute A plus 17 um, first, uh, then we would destroy a value uh, that we need to compute A of zero. And there's a simple trick. Um, if you run a loop backwards and you get a different result, then likely you had a bad loop carry dependency um, that basically induces this, this sort of order. 
The other thing that is important to remember is that loop care dependencies have a distance. So in this case, since we're using A of I and A of I plus 17 in the same iteration, the distance is 17 because basically we have to make sure that in one iteration, we retain um, the value of A that is 17 iterations away from the current iteration. And so if we, if we wanna um, visualize this a little more, um, typically this is now interactive in, in our um, on-site tutorials, so the question is, can we parallelize the loop? And I'll give you the answer. Um, so basically we can visualize um, the data dependency by drawing arrows between the source iteration and the sync iteration where the um, iteration is, is um, or the, the loop care dependency lands. And then, you know, if we just assume that we have two threads available and we cut the iteration space like we were showing earlier using a work sharing Instruct, um, directive in OpenMP, we would cut it such that we have the left half of the loop and the right half of the loop. And this is indicated by this uh, red bar in the middle. And so what you'll see is that the red bar basically cuts the blue arcs that I was drawing between the loop iterations. And that's a very uh, visual um, representation of what is typically called a race condition or what causes a race condition. So the answer is no, we cannot parallelize this, this code at least not easily. Um, and so I put this brackets uh, next to it because somebody in the tutorials was, uh, was explaining to me that there's like, you know, very specific loop schedules, how you can make this work in parallel, but that exploits a whole bunch of corner cases in the OpenMP language uh, that, we know, that we better not get into at this point. All right, now the question is, can we vectorize the loop? All right, let's see how vectorization works. Um, so the vector register has a certain size. And so that it's completely agnostic of any particular hardware out there, I chose a vector size of seven, okay? So the way a vectorization now works in this, um, in this loop is that in, some, in, in the first window, um, we basically compute the first seven elements using a SIMD vector register. Then we shift the window to the next seven iterations. And then we shift the, the window even more to the next, uh, the following seven iterations. And so by the time we hit the sync iterations of a dependency, um, we already processed the source iterations of that dependency. And so, yes, we can vectorize this code if we choose a vector length that is shorter than any distance of any loop carry dependency in that code. And since we had 17 as the distance and we used um, seven byte SIMD machine, that um, worked perfectly. All right, and then to almost finish up um, and lead into uh, the September, like as a cliffhanger almost. Um, so in a time before OpenMP4, this was the code that people typically wrote like pragma omp parallel four to get nice uh, work share thread, multi-threaded parallelism. And then any weird combination of vendor specific uh, loop directives to say something like always vectorize, don't assume um, or ignore assumed loop care dependencies. And then, you know, I'm even showing the short form here, whereas say IVDEP ha IV has slightly different meaning for different compilers. So you even had to have like compilation guards that said, if this compiler then use these set of pragmas, if that compiler use this other set. Um, and then you had to trust your compiler to do the right thing. If you didn't trust the compiler to do the right thing, uh, you had to switch to something else, like use a different programming model or use low level constructs like um, x86 intrinsics that are the C equivalent of, um, of um, assembly programming just in C, C++ syntax. All right, with that, back to you, Christian. And I'll leave you with this cliffhanger to basically tease you to come back in September to see what happened previously in the episode. And then we continue with Cindy. Christian, you're up. Yeah, I'm I'm working on sharing my screen. I'm not not allowed to share my screen. No, I am. Oops, come on. 
So we are at the end of our presentation and the end of the time slot. So we have a couple of hands-on um, work that you can try out to experience NUM optimization and also SIMD programming for yourself. And uh, since we weren't able to fully cover SIMD, of course, we can continue and will continue and you can continue with those exercises in uh, September. Uh, same procedure as every time. So uh, we have this uh, GitHub repository containing the slides in PDF form, but also the source uh, codes, yeah? uh, the folders, um, or there are uh, exercises for C, C++, and Fortran available. And uh, we will provide, or they do contain solutions already. And uh, we have uh, four exercises this time uh, the Pi code, you might remember it from the first session. Um, this time you're not asked to parallelize it, but to vectorize it. That means to introduce OpenMP SIMD. Then there's uh, Stream and uh, Jacobi. So optimize uh, the code uh, for NUMA. And uh, Helen provided um, exercise number two. Any comment, Helen? So there are some um, more yeah, I did I did two and three. Okay. okay. <laughs> oh yes. Sorry. So I think the I think you you would put two first so you can follow the the NUMA uh, settings and getting hardware information on parameter and then try to understand that then use those information for three and four to optimize it. So if you check out uh, the code from GitHub, there's also a uh, document meaning a PDF document to actually. Uh, give you additional instructions on what to do with the codes, how to execute them, and so forth. As I said, same procedure as in the previous two times. I believe that concludes our part, right, Helen? Yes. Thank you so much, Christian and Michael. Excellent pre presentations and uh, pre prepare homework. We'll review them uh, in September session, as I said earlier.